Chapter 11. Building Effective Teams In 1860, storm clouds over the issue of slavery intensified in the United States to the point a violent outburst appeared imminent. The new Republican Party elected its first presidential candidate, the relatively unknown Abraham Lincoln. In victory, Lincoln defeated three men who were eminently more qualified for the office than he was. William H. Seward, a New York senator and a powerful orator, was the leading Republican. Salmon Chase was the influential governor of Ohio, and Edward Bates the leading statesman from Missouri. These ambitious men, along with Gideon Wells, Montgomery Blair, and eventually Edward Stanton, would form Lincoln's cabinet. Notes Doris Kearns Goodwin, Every member of this administration was better known, better educated, and more experienced in public life than Lincoln. Their presence in the cabinet might have threatened to eclipse the obscure prairie lawyer from Springfield. Nevertheless, the Herculean effort of this unusual team during the nadir of American history would save the Republic and earn Lincoln his reputation as America's first modern president. Even the most outstanding leaders cannot accomplish significant tasks apart from the capable effort of others. A solitary leader is a contradiction in terms. History's most heralded leaders learn how to maximize the talents and sacrifices of others to multiply their efforts. The Duke of Wellington will be forever remembered as Napoleon's conqueror at Waterloo, but Wellington was successful due to the enormous sacrifices of his loyal lieutenants. At the close of the Battle of Waterloo, rather than exuberantly celebrating his immortal victory, Wellington ate his dinner at a table set for many of his officers who would never return to dine with him again. Hours later, Dr. John Hume arrived to give a preliminary report of the officers who had been wounded or killed during the Titanic conflict. As I entered, he sat up, his face covered with dust and sweat of the previous day, and extended his hand to me, which I took and held in mine. Whilst I told him of Gordon's death and of such casualties as have come to my knowledge, he was much affected. I felt the tears dropping fast upon my hand, and looking towards him, saw them chasing one another in furrows over his dusty cheeks. He brushed them away suddenly with his left hand, and he said to me in a voice tremulous with emotion, Well, thank God. I don't know what it is to lose a battle, but certainly nothing can be more painful than to gain one with the loss of so many of one's friends. Perhaps it was the staggered loss of his brave officers that led Wellington to conclude, Next to a battle lost, the greatest misery is a battle gained. While Wellington would attain his nation's highest honors and ultimately the Prime Minister's office, he always knew his glory and fame was purchased with the lives of many of Britain's finest young men. Likewise, while Robert E. Lee was heralded as a daring and brilliant general, he relied heavily on Stonewall Jackson to gain some of his most brilliant victories. Of Jackson, Lee observed, such an executive officer, the sun never shone on. I have but to show him my design, and I know that if it can be done, it will be done. No need for me to send or watch him. Straight as a needle to the pole, he advances to the execution of my purpose. When Lee learned that Jackson's left arm was amputated as a result of his wounds, Lee retorted, He has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right arm. Lee always maintained he could have won the decisive battle at Gettysburg had he still had Jackson to lead the advance. The greatest leaders in history have recognized their dependence on others. A leadership team is a reflection of its leader. Leaders who build crack leadership teams do the following six things. Leaders develop a dynamic culture. Whether you study the esprit de corps of victorious armies such as those under Alexander, Caesar, or Patton, or analyze the corporate cultures of enormously successful companies in their prime, such as Standard Oil or Microsoft, you will unearth vigor, confidence, and creativity that clearly set them apart from their opposition. Such a brilliant and upbeat collective disposition derives from a variety of sources, but when it is present, teams produce their greatest work. Developing a dynamic, problem-solving, creative, and hard-working team begins by hiring the right people. Lehman and Pentec observe, your people are your greatest competitive advantage. 
Jim Collins qualifies, the old adage, people are your most important asset, turns out to be wrong. People are not your most important asset. The right people are. Leaders develop superior teams by intentionally hiring or enlisting the best people possible for their organizations. Edward Lawler III argues that companies ought to fire managers who do not attract or retain the best employees. Kevin McFarland suggests that successful companies hire attitude and trained aptitude. McFarland notes that when successful startup companies interviewed potential employees, recruiters sought to unearth the applicant's character. Interviewers assumed their opinion of the world is also a confession of character. McFarland concluded, breakthrough companies strive first to hire people of character and their performance tends to take care of itself. The key to interviewing potential staff is not to ask them what they would do, but what they have done. Anyone can proclaim what they would do in a hypothetical situation, but the most reliable way to predict future behavior is to discover what applicants did in previous situations. Likewise, those enlisting staff must seek to determine the aspirant's honesty. One way to discern this is to ask candidates to describe a time when they failed and what they did in response. If applicants cannot recall a previous failure, they are not being honest. By sharing a misstep, interviewees are demonstrating both honesty and humility, two important traits in new hires. Seth Godin concludes, when you hire amazing people and give them freedom, they do amazing stuff. Challenging missions require carefully chosen teams. The book of Leviticus eludicates the high standard God maintains for those who serve him. When God chose to deliver the Israelites from the Minnitites, he did not rely on large numbers, but on a carefully selected team. David was a great military leader, but he had a group of mighty men who were proven in battle to form the nucleus of his invincible army. Leaders in the early church, such as overseers and deacons, had to meet a rigorous standard to be elected. Even Jesus, before he chose his twelve disciples, spent an entire night in prayer making sure he selected those his father was giving him. These men were ordinary business people, but their character allowed them to be fashioned into extraordinary apostles. The greatest liability for many organizations is careless recruitment. Simply hiring the best person available is not always wise. It may be more prudent to delay filling a position until the right person is discovered. Many a chagrin leader has discovered it's better to endure a vacancy than to impatiently hire the wrong candidate. Jim Collins advises organizations not to hire people from the outside who do not know or embrace the corporate culture. Collins' mantra is, first who, then what. The building blocks of outstanding organizations are excellent people. To attract such individuals, leaders must inspire greatness. Horace Walpole once commented to Sir William Pitt the Elder, a minister that inspires great actions must be great minister. The reason some organizations fail to attract exceptional talent is their leadership is unexceptional. Godin observes, the organizations of the future are filled with smart, fast, flexible people on mission. The thing is, that requires leadership. Generally speaking, quality employees have numerous options before them, and salary benefits are only one factor in choosing which organizations to join. People want to invest their lives into something worthwhile. As Kuzis and Posner note, people commit to causes, not plans. Commitment is fueled by what we cherish. Leaders who promote a mundane cause and provide ordinary management will entice average people. Most importantly, leaders must go to great lengths, if necessary, to enlist the best people for their team. They may have to be aggressive in the salary package or working conditions they offer. They will need to provide a cause worth investing in as well as a job that challenges and rewards team members. Leaders may also have to overcome their own bias or preconceived methodology to enlist people with a fresh, creative approach. John Rockefeller attributed the secret to his success to my confidence in men and my ability to inspire their confidence in me. At one point, Rockefeller's Standard Oil lost a court case. Rockefeller immediately contacted the opposing attorney and said, 
Mr. Klein, you have given us a good licking. Now I would like to have you come and work for me. Likewise, Abraham Lincoln recruited his former opponents and critics if he felt they were the best people for the job. As a result, these leaders developed unbeatable teams. The best leaders are always on the lookout for exceptional talent they can add to their ranks. Leaders who are not attracting outstanding talent must take a long, hard look in the mirror. Leaders maximize diversity. Leaders are unwise to merely take on people who see and do things the same way they do. To thrive in a complex and diverse world, teams must have a wide spectrum of perspectives and skills at their disposal. Kuzis and Posner cite a study demonstrating that homogenous groups are more likely to reach incorrect conclusions when problem-solving than are heterogeneous teams, and yet despite their errors, they tend to be more confident of their conclusions. Naturally, groups who view reality from the same vantage point will reach agreement far more quickly than diverse groups, yet unanimity of opinions or reaching consensus is not necessarily a team's most important goal what is crucial in determining the best solution. For that extensive discussion, and even debate is needed. If this is to occur, leaders must intentionally recruit a multifaceted group to work with them. Christian organizations often mistake unity as the highest virtue. Yet, if this means people are reluctant to raise questions or to challenge unproven assumptions, then organizations may maintain unity all the way to their ruin. Christian ministries have made enormous mistakes because no one wanted to appear divisive or negative when doing the Lord's work. Yet unity is most evident when diverse people honestly and fearlessly share their concerns, yet remain committed to their fellow team members and to the organizational goals. Historically, the greatest teams have included a variety of strong personalities. Consider Jesus' twelve disciples, outspoken Peter, always quick to get the discussion started, was balanced by young, tender-hearted John. The group included pessimistic Thomas, approachable Andrew, and the formerly despised tax collector, Matthew. Simon the Zealot was a rebel, while Nathaniel was known for his integrity. God chose a motley team with whom to launch a movement that has continued for more than 2,000 years. Leading variegated teams requires a strong leader with superlative people skills. The Duke of Marlborough led a coalition of international forces for 10 years on foreign soil against the world's superpower and yet managed to meld them into an unbeatable force. Much of Marlborough's success resulted from his ability to work with people. It was said that he could refuse a favor with more grace than others could grant one. As leaders build their teams, there are at least three areas in which team members should exhibit diversity. Diversity of perspective. A winning team intentionally assembled to include men and women as well as various personality types, ethnic groups, and educations will result in a diversity of perspectives. Hiring duplicates of yourself from your alma mater or creating a troop of uniform thinkers may avoid dissension and strife, but as Ronald Heifes notes, without conflicting frames of reference, the social system scrutinizes only limited features of its problematic environment. It operates at the mercy of its blind spots. Today's organizations cannot afford blind spots. An illustration from Richard Blackaby. Richard learned an important lesson while he was leading a seminary. During faculty meetings, one professor was always more reluctant than others to jump on board with the new proposals. This could be frustrating because numerous changes were needed and the constant questions about how the students, staff, and constituents would perceive the innovations seemed like a needless hand-wringing. Then a personality inventory revealed that every faculty member but that one person had a cognitive, task-oriented disposition. The hesitant professor was an effective, people-oriented individual. Moreover, most of the faculty earned their doctorates at the same school, not surprisingly, the one the professor studied elsewhere. The faculty was too homogeneous. All the professors were brilliant people who knew how to think critically. Nevertheless, their similar perspectives produced a dangerously insular facility. The one person who could have been viewed as out of sync with the, whole, the rest of the team was actually a much-needed cautionary voice in a room full of type A personalities. 
According to Patrick Lanisi, leadership team meetings that regularly proceed with unanimity and minimal discussion are unhealthy. In his books, Death by Meeting and The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he encourages teams to engage in vigorous debate over issues so every option and potential problem is uncovered and considered. This dynamic can be especially difficult for groups that experience previous success together. David Doltlich and Peter Caro warn, today, leaders must discipline themselves to look at problems and opportunities with a fresh eye. This is difficult because people naturally want to repeat an approach that worked in a similar situation. It is a challenge to consider an alternative to what brought you success in the past or to your current position in the present. It is imperative to build diverse teams with fresh and varied perspectives that are not enslaved to the traditional and previously successful paradigms. A leader with good people skills can foster and encourage vigorous discussion without losing control or condoning verbal assaults in the process. Basidi and Sharon note, only a leader can ask the tough questions that everyone needs to answer, then manage the process of debating the information and making the right trade-offs. Only the leader can set the tone of the dialogue in the organization. Dialogue is the core of culture and the basic unit of work. How people talk to each other absolutely determines how well the organization will function. Leaders who want an effective team will avoid monopolizing the discussion during meetings. Rather, they will facilitate engaging, stimulating, comprehensive discussions that uncover a wide array of options and potential pitfalls in determining the best response to the challenge at hand. Leaders who see the entire battlefield are always at an advantage over those who have a limited perspective. Diversity of Skills Teams are designed to accomplish tasks. Pat McMillan concludes, No task, no team. Unless an assignment is extremely focused and requires only a limited set of skills, effective teams must have a wide array of abilities at their disposal. Astute leaders fully develop and use the skills and talents of their team members. A team of highly skilled personnel is a wasted resource if members are not called on to leverage their unique talents for the good of the organization. In that vein, leaders should understand that a team member can shine in one setting and yet stumble in another. William Pitt, the Elder, distinguished himself as a national leader while serving in Britain's Minister of War during the Seven Years' War. However, later when he achieved the office of Prime Minister, the great wartime minister was very quickly proved no minister for times of peace. Pitt's decisive nature, while imperative during a crisis, led one critic to describe him as, in principle a friend to liberty, but in his temper a tyrant. Pitt enjoyed center stage and insisted on having his way. He was not good at listening to the contrary views of others. His biographer concluded, Pitt's public persona encouraged him to cultivate admiring differential associates like Beckford, rather than colleagues and allies who could aid constructive achievement. In reality, Pitt was utterly unable to bring out and benefit from the talents of others. His success hinged on his own giftedness and energy and not on the collective skills and talents of his colleagues. Likewise, Oliver Cromwell was invincible when leading an army of Puritan soldiers into battle. However, according to his biographer, the tragedy of Oliver Cromwell as a statesman was that those qualities that had raised him in war, qualities so natural to his character, decision, speed, and dash in critical situations, the ability to strike and strike hard, could in the far more ambiguous sphere of politics turn to be quite something else. The trouble was that these adaptive qualities were not only less attractive, but even in the long term less effective. It was patience, management, reserve, and cunning which Milton's chief of men needed to bring about the victories of peace. General George Patton continually got himself in trouble off the battlefield. Before the Normandy invasion, General Eisenhower was under enormous pressure to demote Patton due to his continual gaffes. Yet Eisenhower recognized he needed Patton's military skills on the battlefield. Giving his chastened commander one last chance to redeem himself, Eisenhower said, You owe us some victories. Pay off, and the world will deem me a wise man. Patton did, indeed, 
use his offensive talents to gain victories for Eisenhower, who was ultimately vaulted into the U.S. presidency. Leaders must be able to identify talent and rigorously apply the skills of their people to the utmost advantage. Diversity in Knowledge Knowledge is a crucial aspect of team selection. Leaders should enlist people who have expertise they lack themselves. If team members cannot tell their leader something the leader doesn't already know, they are redundant. Modern leaders must lead knowledgeable workers. It's imperative, therefore, to create a culture which attracts outstanding knowledge workers and gives them the opportunity to thrive. Leaders must also be willing to heed the counsel of the experts they install around themselves. During the tumultuous and dangerous days after Julius Caesar's assassination, powerful and cunning figures such as Mark Anthony, Brutus, Cicero, and Cassius were all vying for power over the empire. The teenage Octavarian, Caesar's acknowledged heir, had no military experience or political power and only limited understanding of political intrigue. It seemed inevitable that he would become another of Rome's political casualties. Yet, as his biographer noted, he had that most essential of political talents, the ability to take good advice. Ultimately, that trait would lead the inexperienced Octavian to overcome his more experienced rivals and to become Rome's first emperor. Leaders love their people. Seth Godin suggests that people perform better when they enjoy their work. People entrust their hopes, dreams, self-worth, and skills into their leaders' hands. Employees who are neglected or exploited will never achieve the creative breakthroughs that emerge in a caring, stimulating, and supportive environment. Max Dupree suggests communities are far more productive than organizations. The leader is responsible for fostering a sense of community. To this end, Bossidy and Sharon suggest leaders should spend at least 40% of their time with people. Jim Collins studied outstanding companies and found that people who worked in the best companies tended to make and keep lifelong friendships. Team members, working toward a meaningful goal, feel cared for by their leaders, will bond with their co-laborers. Such concern by leaders must be real. A generic Christmas card or inter-office memo can never substitute for genuine concern by the leader. During the Battle of the Nile, Admiral Nelson was struck down by a piece of shrapnel. When he was taken below deck for medical attention, the Admiral waved the physician away, saying, Nope, I will take my turn with my brave fellows. Such authentic humility and concern for his crew became legendary among Nelson's men and inspired them to Herculean feats on his behalf. In 1915, the ship Endurance became entrapped in the ice flows off the Antarctic coast, and it sank. The captain, Ernst Shackleton, and his men survived nine months on the ice-packed seas. Then, taking two men with him, Shackleton sailed in a small boat through lethal weather for 700 miles to get help for his crew. In one of the greatest rescues in history, Shackleton managed to bring his crew home safely. His biographer noted, No one seemed to doubt that Shackleton would save them all, and for him it was a responsibility on which he seemed to thrive. It was almost as if he lived on a sense of being needed by his people. Great leaders go to enormous lengths to care for their people. Jesus described the difference between a hireling, a thief, and a good shepherd. He said hirelings abandon the sheep under their care at the first sign of difficulty. Thieves remain with the flock, but only to profit at the sheep's expense. In contrast, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Effective leaders create an environment of trust and concern for those they work with. Leaders maintain focus. Teams produce their best work when the mission is clear and their efforts are focused. Pat McMillan argues, the single most important ingredient in team success is a clear, common, compelling task. The power of a team flows out of each team member's alignment to its purpose. Teams struggle when they lose sight of their goal. It's the leader's responsibility to keep the team centered on its mission. Teams can become so enmeshed in doing good things they spend insufficient time on essential tasks. 
Organizations, no matter how dynamic they initially are, can easily lapse into bureaucracies in which policies, procedures, and meetings dominate people's efforts more than accomplishing their fundamental purpose. People all want to believe their work is crucial and requisite to the organization's success. But in reality, bureaucracies employ most of their people in mundane or peripheral work, while few people are allocated to the central mission or primary issues. Seth Godin points out, many people spend all their time trying to defend what they do. Just because a staff person or a leader has a busy schedule does not entail they are doing work critical for their organization. Every team member has an opinion about what the organization's priority should be. But effective teams stay riveted to their mandate. They relentlessly protect their priorities. Leaders keep their team focused and regularly delineate its objectives. An inordinate amount of infighting is a red flag alerting the leader that the team has lost its focus. Vigorous debate is healthy. Constant arguing, personal attacks, and sabotage are debilitating. In 1957, John Diefenbacher led the Conservative Party of Canada to power for the first time in 22 years. The following year, another election saw Diefenbacher re-elected as Prime Minister when his Conservatives obliterated the Liberals, taking 208 seats to the Liberals' 49. It was the largest electoral victory in Canadian history, and it gave Diefenbacher a clear mandate to implement the many changes he vociferously demanded. The Canadian electorate saw Dief the chief, as their crusader for a new order. But Diefenbacher seemed more adept at seeking power than wielding it. He struggled to make decisions and often backpedaled on commitments his cabinet ministers assumed were in place. Because he was unable to manage his own cabinet, his ministers eventually rebelled against him. Seventeen of them departed his cabinet in the final ten months before his electoral defeat in 1963. Despite Diefenbaker's impassioned speeches and debates in Parliament, he was unceremoniously swept from power in 1963 by a population weary of rhetoric without corresponding action. The problem was not a matter of able personnel. Diefenbacher's colleagues were bright and talented. Rather, the party's downfall was their leader's inability to keep his team focused and progressing in a singular direction. A third symptom revealing a team had lost its focus is when members become obsessed with their own positions, pay, and perks, rather than with the accomplishment of organizational goals. A desire for premier offices is nothing new. James and John sought the two most coveted positions in Jesus' kingdom. It's only natural for people to pursue the highest offices available and to be drawn to the largest salary. However, when people become consumed with accumulating impressive titles, larger offices, and executive benefits, while remaining blithely unconcerned that the organization is routinely underperforming, they have lost sight of the purpose for their work. Leaders foster healthy communication. Movements that once were vigorous and flexible eventually become institutionalized, bureaucratized, and marginalized. Every institution, no matter how flat it may have begun, inevitably develops a hierarchy. In, in times past, hierarchies were necessary because CEOs could not personally relate to a thousand employees. Busy leaders dealt with a limited number of direct reports, and those lieutenants were responsible for transmitting information down the line to the rank and file. This approach bred numerous problems. For one, as Cuzos and Postner point out, the higher up you go the corporate ladder, the less likely it is leaders will ask for feedback. Leaders want to know how their subordinates are doing, but rarely seek feedback from their own performance. The more steep and complex the hierarchy, the more diluted is the feedback ascending to the leader. Likewise, when information trickles down from the top through numerous layers of bureaucracy, key pieces of information are frequently withheld. Middle managers may feel those lower down don't need as much information, or they may want to retain an advantage without holding facts. Warren Bennis calls hierarchies a prosthesis for trust. Information is power. The more information accessible to your team, the more empowered they become. Just as information drives modern organizations, so hierarchies in executive floor offices tend to dissipate organizational energy. Modern leaders who are serious about providing real-time information to team members 
have three primary tools available to them, technology, architecture, and meetings. Technology. Computer networks make information available to staff even if they are dispersed globally. Agents in Hong Kong can access the company network to immediately gain pertinent information from Kansas City. Video conferencing and numerous other communication technologies allow people to hold strategic meetings with people around the world. Electronic memos and webinars allow timely dissemination in information. Architecture. The physical layout of an organization can do much to enhance or impede team effectiveness. Large executive offices, far removed from the shop floor, can cause far more separation than a short elevator ride might suggest. When Richard was a seminary president, the entire faculty and staff were initially housed in one building. When a second, larger academic building was constructed, the faculty was moved to the new facility while the administrative office remained where it was. The two structures were joined by an attractive, windowed, enclosed hallway and required only a short walk between buildings. Nevertheless, Richard began hearing rumblings from faculty members who felt out of touch with what was happening in the administrative building. The president and his administrative team were as available as before, but the physical barrier of a hallway changed the team dynamics. We know an architectural firm that highly valued teamwork and cross-collaboration. To facilitate its values, a facility was designed so there were no offices, only cubicles and a large work area. Everyone worked together in one spacious room where information sharing and creative brainstorming was greatly enhanced. Even the president chose to move out of his corner office and into a cubicle so he could be more involved in his people's work. While this configuration would not work well for every organization, wise leaders nonetheless ensure their organization's facilities enhance teamwork and communication. Meetings Technology has reduced the necessity for the number of meetings required by organizations, but face-to-face -face encounters with staff continue to be needed. Leaders make use of a variety of settings to ensure their people are kept abreast of critical information. Regular team meetings, periodic staff retreats, even stand-up five-minute briefings at the beginning of the day can be useful in disseminating information. Meetings with staff over a meal, as well as town hall meetings, can be effective instruments from a leader's communication tool belt. For teams to accomplish dynamic, creative, problem-solving work, they must have fast, reliable, crucial information, and the leader's role is to ensure they do. Leaders help their people grow. Most people want to believe their life makes a difference in the world. People want to do more than merely earn a living through their work. Why do some people accept lower pay or fewer perks to work in one place rather than opt for better remuneration at another organization? Because of less tangible but more important benefits such as joy and meaning derived from their work or because they feel they are contributing to a better society. Jim Collins advises that leaders assign their best people to the biggest opportunities, not the biggest problems. Furthermore, he suggests, managing your problems can only make you good, whereas building your opportunities is the only way to become great. Wise leaders assign challenging tasks to their staff so they remain invigorated and so they grow personally and professionally. If your people do not grow under your leadership, you are not investing in them properly. An illustration from Richard. A large mission organization invited Richard's academic dean to consider moving to Europe to lead their extensive European efforts. The dean had joined the facility as a professor, but quickly demonstrated leadership ability and was promoted to the dean's office. The mission agency noted his excellence as a leader and considered him highly qualified for their position. He felt awkward seeking time off to investigate the job opportunity, but Richard assured him that he was extremely talented, so of course other agencies would covet his services. Number two, Richard felt obligated to help staff members reach their maximum potential, and in some cases, it was understood they would have to move on to other organizations to do this. Number three, Richard cared about his dean and would not want to stymie his career. Number four, finally, and most importantly, Richard trusted his dean's walk with God and knew he would act with integrity based on what he sensed God leading him to do. The dean did make the trip to Europe, and to Richard's delight, did not sense God's leading him to make the move. 
He continues to do an outstanding job at the seminary as of this writing. Besides holding a genuine concern for their people, leaders also recognize that as their team members' capacity to lead increases, the organization's capacity to succeed also expands. Leaders are wise to maintain a healthy professional development budget and encourage their people to participate in seminars and programs that will enhance their professional growth. If leaders are going to encourage personal and professional growth in their people, they will have to develop a high pain threshold for failure. By allowing team members to try, and therefore sometimes fail, leaders can help their people process their mistakes and use them as stepping stones toward personal growth. Jesus gave ordinary fishermen the amazing opportunity to become his disciples and to change the world. Peter, one of those fishermen, had the additional opportunity to become the Twelve Apostles' chief spokesperson. Yet at a crucial moment, Peter denied his Lord. After that humiliating experience, Peter might well have concluded that he lacked what it took to be a good leader. He returned to his fishing. Perhaps he was renounced to his earlier calling, or at the very least, he was attempting something he believed he could do successfully. Yet despite fishing all night, Peter and his companions caught nothing. Another failure. What did Jesus do? First, he allowed his discouraged followers to experience a success. He instructed them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat, and the catch was so immense they could not draw it in. Then Jesus entered a redemptive conversation with his chagrined disciple. Rather than asking Peter to proclaim his loyalty, as Peter had so confidently done earlier, Jesus asked him to affirm his love. Previously, Peter wanted to impress others. Now Jesus got to the heart of the matter. By the time Jesus and Peter parted that day, Peter knew Jesus wasn't finished with him yet. He had a new assignment. Peter became a powerful leader in the early church, and we have no record of him ever denying his Lord again. If modern organizations are to become great, they must develop their people and help them mature through their mistakes. There was a business unit leader at BP in the exploration and production business commissioned to develop and construct a challenging new $1.2 billion deep water production platform. Note, this was before the Deepwater Horizon tragedy in the Gulf in 2010. The timetable was tight, the technology challenging and the overall success of the project was far from certain. This man took some calculated risks to deliver the project, but nonetheless, through a complex series of mistakes, overruns, and other issues, many beyond the immediate control of this leader, the project failed. The money was lost entirely. Shamed and embarrassed, the leader personally tenured his resignation to the CEO. The CEO responded, You gotta be kidding me! I just invested $1.2 billion in the training of one of my finest leaders, and now he wants to quit? Get out of my office and get back to work. Because the leaders lost credibility with his peers in e &P, the CEO wisely reassigned him to another division where he could start fresh. The executive succeeded in his new role and eventually made his way back to e &P, where he experienced numerous successes in that stream of the business. The most outstanding people will sign up and remain with leaders who bring out their best. A sure indication of a successful leader is the collective and consistent testimony of subordinates who are grateful for what they learned and how they grew while they worked under that leader. Conclusion Leaders can initiate personal growth all by themselves, but to change and grow organizations, leaders depend on other people. To launch a movement, Leaders must interface with numerous people. Great leaders multiply their efforts by developing teams. A skilled team can accomplish far more than a talented individual. The key to success in today's complex, rapidly changing world is developing a diverse, skilled, flexible, and creative team with the freedom to grow and to fail in pursuit of its mission. This must be one of the leader's top priorities. Building effective teams, leaders develop a dynamic culture. Leaders maximize diversity. Leaders love their people. Leaders maintain focus. Leaders foster healthy communication. Leaders maximize their people.